All right, y'all, so we back with five strange UFO videos that must be seen. We'll be the judge of that. Let's check them out. The Black Disc. This video was recorded on December 21st, 2023 in the East Coast city of Christchurch, situated in New Zealand's South Island. The short video captures what appears to be a circular or disc-shaped object, which is black in colour and moving at various speeds as the camera attempts to keep track of its movements. Upon initial viewing, the UFO seems to have a gaping hole in the middle of it. However, eyewitnesses claim that this was actually a bulge or bump on the craft's structure. The person behind the camera states that I stared at it for ages and thought that it was just some trash or something floating, but it was so bizarre. It was donut shaped like a disc. It was flat to my surprise, as it revealed when it glided around. It was just hovering and swaying a bit when I first saw it. <clears throat> Weirdly, the aerial entity turns translucent before reverting back to its metallic color and texture, fascinating those on the ground. The transparency of the object, not to mention its strange ability to morph into different compositions, has startled those who have watched the video, as well as those who were at the scene. The eyewitness goes on to say that I felt like something was watching me, and I watched it all the way home and had to film it. I still can't believe my eyes. So strange. Take a look. Despite there being very few major sightings of unidentified flying objects in New Zealand, this video has certainly got people talking and shifted the spotlight to our friends from the land of the long white cloud. So what do you think about this one? Could it be a shape-shifting UFO capable of physical transformations Definitely. that beggars belief? Could it be merely a smoky cloud or floating balloon of sorts? Or could it be a hoax? We'd love to know your thoughts on this one. Out of everything we've seen, I've never seen that video before. It's a little glitchy. I will say that it is a little glitchy, but I don't know. That that could be a, a wide range of things, uh, a drone included. But if you heard what he was saying leading up to the video, the speeds at which it was moving and different things about it is what has everybody like baffled. Some weirds going on. Sierra Nevada Mountains. This video was recorded on December 17th, 2023 in the city of Portville, located at the base of the Southern Sierra Nevada Mountains in Tulare County, California. The footage was captured by the Reddit user, Jesus Alanis 111 and has since been reposted on YouTube, Twitter and other social media platforms. The object was spotted by the user after they purchased a drone and were in the process of testing its flying and recording capabilities for the very first time. The eyewitness states on Reddit that I was exploring the skies when I saw a black dot dripping from the clouds, so I started recording. The raw footage that you see was taken on the DJI Maverick 3 Pro Cine on December 17th, 2023 in Portville, California. Take a look at this. According to the user, who was very specific in their description of the events, reports that they had traveled to the city, Vasilia, to the electronics Bro. retailer Best Buy to pick up a brand new drone the day before the sighting. After making the purchase, they immediately got to work with regard to constructing, testing and enjoying their new toy, taking note of its maneuverability, agility and recording prospects. It was then that the eyewitness spotted something drop out of the sky and fall towards the ground below. A dark circular object caught their eye and provided them with an ideal opportunity to take the drone out for a trial run. They recall, suddenly I saw a black dot dripping from the sky. So I decided to focus the drone camera towards the sphere object and I started following it as I was getting closer. I zoomed in on 7x optical zoom to conserve the quality of the video, but then later on I zoom in to 28x digital zoom. As you can see from the footage taken that day, the object moves at various speeds and within sight of the drone's camera. It, it knows it's being followed and wishes to be seen. The drone can't even keep up. It can't even keep up. Like, we deserve to know what this is, man. What is this stuff? The zoom function on the drone gives us a remarkable shot of the circular-shaped entity from a bird's eye perspective, 
which certainly looks like a UFO. Eventually, the user loses track of the saucer after attempting to rotate and flip the drone. Their limited knowledge of drones is admitted in their post. However, what they capture that day proves that drones are definitely useful when tracking and identifying UFOs. Now we of course cannot say this is alien in nature, but it is a UFO, as it's still unidentified. Let us know if you can identify it in the comments section below. Yeah. A Google Maps UFO The internet is a wonderful tool. No matter what you need, want, or are merely curious about, all you have to do is Google it. The search engine has come a long way after it was founded on the 4th of September 1998. Nowadays Google has a multitude of applications including Google Play, Google Podcasts, and Google Maps and Street View, the latter being the focus of this particular entry. What is fascinating about modern technology is that with Google Street View, one can simply enter a set of coordinates or specific address and view a complete 360 degree image of their chosen location. Facts. The date of the discovery was on December 16th, 2023. The location, Sevaco Navero, a municipality in the province of Palencia, Spain. As the video shows, a black saucer shaped object is captured by the Google Maps camera as it hovers above a mountaintop. Zooming in closer, one can clearly see that the image is not faked and is congruent with the rest of the visuals. There are many cases of UFO sightings across Spain, as well as other countries within Europe. Something that shows no sign of slowing down, especially with the rise of TikTok, YouTube and other social media platforms. Now could it be that our modern technological advancements are now able to capture evidence of unidentified aerial phenomena by accident? If so, one may wonder what secret government projects and alien truth seekers have purposely caught on tape. What is even more sinister is the fact that no matter where you are in the world, there is a digital snapshot of your city, town and house. Facts. On a more fun and positive note, you can take a look at the picture for yourself. The coordinates are on screen and in the description box below. Go back, let's look back at that. See? I don't, I, I don't understand, bro. With all the video footage that we had, why don't we get any answers? And I disagree with, with a point he said, you know, with all the stuff that we have and the information that we have, it doesn't feel like it's slowing down. To me, it feels like it's slowing down. We, we testified before Congress, the, the pilots did. Then we had the jellyfish UAP. But it doesn't seem to be, we, we don't hear anything. Have y'all heard anything? Any updates, any news, any, nothing, nothing. So to me, it does feel like it's slowing down. Feels kind of like somebody's trying to suppress it. Screen and in the description box below. What is this object? Keeping with the more recent video releases, this one was posted on YouTube channel, Living the Good Life, where the creators posed the question, what is this object hovering in the sky? It's certainly worth a watch. Take a look. The object was seen over the skies of Chester County, Pennsylvania, which borders between the smaller states of Delaware and Maryland. Known for having and preserving major farmlands in the region, this particular sighting took place over a rural farm not far from West Chester University, on December 1st, 2023. The video appears genuine in nature, as the object is barely visible due to the distance between its location and the person behind the camera. The image is unclear and merges with the external clouds and skyline. Whatever it is, it is large and slow moving. When the camera zooms in to focus on its structure, we can see that it's dark, saucer shaped and almost hovering in the sky or at least moving very slowly across the picturesque horizon. As we come to learn more of the government's secret operations, militarized aerial advancements and UAP disclosures due to workings and efforts of Dr. Stephen Greer, Jeremy Corbell and George Knapp, the possibility that this video has captured some sort of alien mothership is not beyond the realms of probability. So what do you think? Could it be a plane, a cloud or something more sinister? 
I think we need more video footage, more access to seeing what's above the clouds. Cause it feels like that's like the perfect hiding spot, perfect spot for them to hide in almost plain sight, but not plain sight. You know what I mean? It just, it, it feels like that. Like we need to get, we need to see what's going on up above the clouds, man, at all times. If there's some way we could tap into a satellite and and get constant feed, get a constant feed and be able to watch it like on a YouTube channel or something, then maybe we could see. But they probably show us, I don't know, they'll figure out a way to, to manipulate that as well. Meteor hiding UFO. We'll end this list with a fascinating visual of a meteor caught on tape as it drops from the sky. However, look closer and you may notice that this natural astronomical event may in fact be harboring something much more intriguing. Take a look. For anyone who has seen the blockbuster movie or heard the legendary soundtrack, War of the Worlds, this video may chill you to the bone. The date of the sighting took place as recently as January 7th, 2024, in the remote village of Northford, a census-designated place comprising of residential and rural land in the town of North Branford, New Haven County, Connecticut. The video captures the meteor as it breaks through the sky and plummets towards the ground below. However, when slowed down, one can see a dark, disc-shaped object lodged in the centre of the rock Close-up shots seem to suggest that something is attached to the meteor as it enters our atmosphere. Could it be that an extraterrestrial spacecraft has piggybacked onto the small asteroid in order to disguise itself and arrive on Earth's surface undetected? If H.G. Wells' story is anything to go by, then there is a strong possibility that an alien craft, or tripod, is now lodged in the grounds of Northwood, biding its time and waiting to rise up. Could this be a far-fetched assumption or a prophecy coming true, as predicted by the Shakespeare of science fiction. We all know the criticism and skeptical backlash George Orwell endured after writing 1984. And yet, all we need to do is look at the modern world to know that he was right. So need we say more? What do you make of this one? Take another closer look. You are watching The Context. It's time for our new weekly segment, AI Decoded. All right, y'all, so in this next video, right, they're saying the U.S. Pentagon explores AI military uses. So maybe they peel the curtains back and let us see some. Let's see. Got a lot to get to, get through, but we begin with the Financial Times and the godfather of artificial intelligence who's issued a stark warning about the technology in a lecture at the University of Oxford. The Washington Post says top military officials at the Pentagon are meeting with AI experts to accelerate the discovery and implementation of the most useful military AI applications. Meanwhile, on the giant freaking robot science website, kill the switch. University of Cambridge is proposing using remote kill switches and lockouts to mitigate a potential AI apocalypse creative publication ad that's what we do let's just announce that we're gonna have kill switches somewhere that's what we do that that's smart that seems so smart age argues when it comes to creativity having a human touch is irreplaceable and human traits like empathy and strategic thinking make all the difference Upworthy focuses on artificial intelligence unlocking our past and how college students are using AI to decode an ancient scroll burned following an eruption by Mount Vesuvius. Some of these texts, they say, could completely rewrite the history of key periods of the ancient world. And finally, in the independent, ChatGPT apparently suffered a recent breakdown with users complaining the AI system started speaking nonsense and was sending out alarming messages. Well, I said there was a lot to get to, didn't I? With me is Priya Lakhani, who's the CEO of Century Tech, an artificial intelligence education technology company that develops AI-powered learning tools. Hello to you. Hi. So look at all your papers. You've got, you're, you are good to go. First thing, let's go back to uh, the Financial Times. Uh, the headline, yeah. how fatalistic should we be on AI? Yeah. This is a speech by Geoffrey Hinton. 
Why should we care about what he says? So Jeffrey Hinton, as you said, is the godfather of AI. So he essentially worked with teams and invented some of the key uh, techniques uh, and architecture that allows us to have artificial intelligence the way that we do today, right? So um, we should listen to him. He's a very, very serious, very, very intelligent individual. So he's done this Oxford lecture. This is not the first time he's given this warning, Sarah, right? Mm. So his issue, and, and this is a really bold statement, he said it was a very strong claim, he thinks that these models, these AI models, like the, the, the chat GPT, the Llama, all of these different types of large language models that create this generative AI, that they have this level of understanding, okay? And that's a really, really big claim because what most people say is no, it's just a lot of pattern recognition. You take a lot of data, like the internet, all the, all the data from the internet, you throw it through these models, you've got these algorithms and it, it shoots out an output. And the output with AI is, is always a probability. Is, this pro is the probability of this word, is it, is it the highest of being the correct word? Whereas he's saying they're starting to display a level of understanding and that's quite a scary proposition. They aren't just statistical, um, you know, pattern recognition. Well, so they're and kind so of learning. They're learning. And so, and so in this article, John Thornhill, who's one of my favourite writers at, at the FT, also, you know, he talks about Noam Chomsky and how he contrasts human linguistic abilities rooted in genetics um, to machines that lack an inherent understanding of language. The, the issue is, is that, I mean, Geoffrey Hinton's, you can't ignore what he's saying. Um, but at the same time, you know, I have to say that I, I'm sort of on the side of people who, you know, his critics who are saying, look, how, how does this stuff actually work? And when we get to one of the later articles, you'll see actually how some of these models can spurt out a load of nonsense and, and they're not quite human. But what's really important about his warnings that are true is that he's warning about um, essentially, you know, racing ahead with the developments of technology. Why? Because he's saying this could be massive job displacement, mm. disinformation and deep fakes, which in every segment of AI Decoded, we've generally covered deep fakes. And then he says that the one area of this that actually terrifies me, you know what I mean? Don't get me wrong, the whole thing terrifies me, but deep fake technology? That is just scary beyond scary of what that could actually do to someone, not just celebrities, to regular everyday common folk like you and I. Taking your face, your voice, your mannerisms and putting it on some type of AI technology and using it, man, and stealing your identity. That is, to me, that what if AI evolves with these intentions to control? And just to give you a little bit of context, there was a research paper by, um, by a group who simulated the Othello board game. And all they did with a GPT was train it with the moves of Othello, the board game, but it didn't, they didn't give the GPT, they didn't train it with the rules of the board game. Mm. And actually what they found at the end was that through this bit of research, the GPT understood the board game what it was like and the rules. And so there's an argument that eventually uh, these sorts of language models could understand the rules of the world and world order. And then we can go to that really, really fantastic global abductive reasoning test, the duck <laughs> test. And okay. there you can say, look, if it walks like, if it, if it swims like a duck, if it quacks like a duck and it looks like a duck, yeah. it's probably a duck. And so that's where you get this huge issue of people saying, does it matter if it understands or if it's simulating understanding? So many big issues. Issue. So many big issues. Yeah. Uh, let's move on to the Washington Post um, because this is uh, military. And uh, one of the things actually Hinton was talking about was pointing that our government's putting profits before safety. And when that comes to something like military, I that think part. everybody's alarm bells start ringing. They do, although, you know, so the Washington Post have got this piece about uh, the Pentagon talking to tech industry leaders saying, you know, how can we leverage AI in the future, but, but safely. Mm. Um, but actually what AI is fantastic at doing is analysing a lot of information faster than human capabilities, right? Uh -huh. So what they're initially talking about is, for example, intelligence, intelligence gathering. For example, if you have conversations that, you know, where you have the transcripts of what people are saying, for a human to go through and analyse a lot of that, a vast amount of that, takes an enormous amount of resource and an enormous amount of effort. So can we leverage artificial intelligence for those purposes? So for intelligence analysis. And then they've looked at training uh, officers. So can we train uh, members of the military in terms of wartime scenarios? Although, two weeks ago. Train military in wartime scenarios. Don't that feel like we're working backwards? Like we design this, instead of coming up with all this and dealing with this before we start implementing, designing, and putting together AI, we should have had this in place first. Now it feels like we've done this, we've started and everything. Now we're realizing what we need in place. So now we're working backwards. Doesn't that feel like that to y'all? Or is it just me? 
know, we covered a story with Christian Fraser on this program about yeah, from the Mail, and the Mail basically had a terrifying study where they looked at AI large language models and what they would do in five military conflict scenarios, and nearly all of them went to war, and some of them nuclear pretty quickly. So the AI is clearly not there, and that was very well recognised uh, during uh, this particular conference. But there are efficiencies that can be gained, and they're not going to stop. And it's just like nuclear. Do you want nuclear weapons in the world at all, at all, ever? No. But the problem is, is there's an arms race. There's a race for countries to, to build AI quicker mm. than the other country over there. I did think because it was, I, I thought it was quite interesting in the article where it talks about on Tuesday, the Pentagon began meetings with tech industry leaders using, talking about AI. Surely, they I mean, normally the military are, are out the front and, and they're using the technology before everyone's even caught up. Do you know, I think, I think where that's from is later down the article, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not a began meetings. However, OpenAI, really interestingly, removed restrictions against military applications from its usage policies page only in January. So I think that it is possible that because they were having those meetings and this conference, there are lots of people vying for military contracts, which are nice and juicy and large, aren't they? Yeah. So it seems like there'll be commercial relationships. Although the British were there, and the British said, actually, we're going to develop our own large language model solution, our own big AI solution, because we've got concerns that our staffers otherwise might be tempted to put in very, very sensitive data into these these other models that are operated and owned by you know, third parties, and obviously that's not safe. Can we move on to the article, yeah. uh, Giant Freaking Robots? Uh, AI apocalypse kill switches could save humanity. Yeah. No nothing like dramatic headlines. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it is a really dramatic headline, and so it's talking essentially about um, having a switch that's fitted into the underlying hardware. What's really, really important about this, okay, you've got these three key components to have artificial intelligence. So you have all this data, you train these algorithms on, you have the algorithms, okay, and then you have compute power, right? So you've got the compute power that's used to execute the algorithms, right, and execute the models. For the compute power, you have chips. So NVIDIA, for example, you've seen the share price rocket mm. recently. You've got these computer chips that are trading anywhere between like twenty to forty thousand dollars a chip, and they're basically they go through a design, fabrication, and testing phase, and then they're distributed to these data centers. So you can't have AI without them. The paper's brilliant. This paper is brilliant. I read the whole thing, and what they're saying is they're saying, look, it's really actually quite difficult to regulate um, the software producers, the people who are developing the algorithms and creating the, the training data. Okay, because mm. they could be anyone, right? Yeah. But actually. It's the, the supply of AI chips is highly inelastic. There are only a handful of parties in the world that do that. So actually, if we create governance models over the, uh, the producers of the chips, right, then you have at least a point of governance that could be pretty critical for policymakers if you want to have visibility and track and assess the, de de the development of AI. If you want to influence who can actually create AI, you can stop chips being given to various parties where you think they might use it for nefarious purposes, then you can enforce standards. So if you see a rogue output somewhere out there in the world, can you trace the output to the AI model, the AI model to the data center, and then essentially switch off and then switch it off that model? Mm. And then it has a brilliant uh, suggestion that it requires compute providers to have something similar to banking providers like KYC, you know, your customer checks. So the idea is that you can then have that traceability. It, okay. Honestly, for anyone who's interested in regulation and governments who hasn't read that paper, it is, it's absolutely brilliant and I recommend that they do. Okay, there we go. That's, a, that's an interesting one. Now, this yeah. is really absolutely fascinating, Upworthy. Um, the concept of a scroll that was burned uh, to a crisp almost at Mount, when Mount Vesuvius erupted yeah. 2,000 years ago, but now using AI, people are being able to decipher what's written. It's yeah. quite astonishing. It's astonishing. So they're using computer vision, um, 3D scanning, and then machine learning to essentially be able to see by... So they virtually, there's, there's a film of this, they virtually unwrap the scroll and it's brilliant, and you can see it in the scroll challenge, the Vesuvius scroll challenge, and then the idea is the ink's actually invisible to the human eye. So then they use these scanning techniques, um, they, they read <laughs> using AI uh, the actual the, the text, and then these teams are asked to help decipher them, and it was this amazing uh, Dr. Brent Seals who pioneered all of this, and they have- And this is the part I'm actually excited about. Decoding ancient scrolls, answering questions about our ancient history and human origin. Oh, for sure, for sure. This uh, I'm interested in this now. Had some of the AI models, but then they had a small team. 
So by launching a challenge, this is what's great about AI, if you mm. launch a challenge, you get lots more people involved, lots more data, then actually you can, you can do a lot more. So it's phenomenal and it's, you know, this is the intersection of archaeology and artificial intelligence. So of all the examples I've ever given of AI on this programme, I've never really talked about archaeology and it is absolutely phenomenal. Well, I'm um, very pleased. I'm very pleased that you started here. <laughs> That's the good side. But it is an incredible thing. It's such a futuristic thing, artificial intelligence, but allowing us to learn about our past, our descendants. Mm -hmm. it's, it is a fascinating... Yeah, sort of... what we're going to uncover about philosophy, yeah. um, it's, you know, it, it will be mind-blowing, I'm sure. Can we move on to ad age? <laughs> you and I talked about this already. We did. Ah. Creatives and AI, why the human <clears throat> touch is irreplaceable. Now, I, I read this, it, it felt like a bit of a motivational tool. I don't know, of, yeah. Sell it, saying, to, saying to ad people, don't worry, AI's not going to take your jobs. You're fine. We still need the creative, but I'm not sure I was convinced. You believe that? You shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. This is a very lovey-dovey piece, and I'm not sure whether I love it or loathe it. It's very sweet, by the way, whoever wrote it. But um, all over social channels, you've seen AI won't replace humans, but humans using AI will replace humans without AI. Now, this piece is mm. all about, look, okay. your human touch is irreplaceable when it comes to marketing text. Can we just be a little bit practical here? I, I'm, and that's true. I think in the future, we crave that human connection. It will actually probably be what makes some things just very different. But at the moment, about not replacing you as a marketer, there are many marketing jobs that I'm sure will still be out there, but there will also be many that won't because AI at the moment, when you can increase by global value 50, by $15 trillion by 2030, increase GDP globally by 28%, what companies are doing is they're saying, can I use these tools to automate and replace, to augment my labour force and make them more efficient and to personalise? So when it affects your OPEX, your operating expenditure, and you can reduce your labour costs, then... That is what some companies will do. So there is some truth to the article. I have some sympathy to it. But it was written by a brand creative agency to marketers who I'm assuming are, are their clients, yeah. right, of large companies. Um, you know, I, it's a very sweet article. But, but essentially, but I just don't but think essentially it's true. saying you still have your human creativity, but actually AI can enhance it is what the article is saying. Yeah. And there is some, there is some truth in that. Some, can although just... Jeffrey Hinton would might disagree. But it's going to take over. Jeffrey Hinton. <laughs> Let's finish with um, ChatGPT, um, which for many people who don't know much about artificial intelligence, probably the one thing they will have really heard about and may have even used is ChatGPT. So it's yeah. quite, it's quite yeah. user friendly, quite big. Uh, apparently it's had a meltdown and it's sending alarming messages to users. This is according to The Independent. Yeah, so and it, 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 did. it started sending out loads of gibberish to people. Um, <laughs> at, at one point, I think in the past, actually, it was being really sassy <laughs> and lazy. Uh, look, it could either be bugs in the system, errors in the training data, issues with the algorithms, <laughs> or what people are calling the temperature. So if you set the temperature of, of the models to being more random and Yeah, more what does creative, that mean, set the temperature? Yeah, it's just really, it, it's where you set, essentially, the ability for the model to start being a bit more random, so therefore it just becomes super creative. And you can set that to a point where, actually, it just spouts a load of nonsense okay. but this then goes back now to saying, she's well, speaking look, gibberish you know, do humans do this if it's understanding the world and understanding how we operate it's already been trained it's already been out there for so long you know would we do that if our brains were intact and so and you know just a few hours ago just it's hot off the press um, but google gemini disabled the ability for images of people to be created on google gemini because we saw in the last 24 to 48 hours, it was generating misleading images of people, you know, from r different races in terms of historical context. So, so you can start to see this is all about the training data. It is about the algorithms and then about the output. It's highly mathematical. Um, but at the same time, you know, but, I, I have to heed Jeffrey Hinton's advice because, uh, you know, he knows what he's talking about in many senses and that debate will continue. It's the hottest question uh, in the field at the it moment. Will. Well, let's leave it on the hottest question. That's a good place to leave. Priya Lakhani, thank you so much.